There we go. Okay, now we're good. All right, so welcome to uh, the latest edition of the uh, Community Hangout, our monthly Community Hangout. Today is November 8th, 2018. And uh, I'm glad we can get in this session before uh, uh, Thanksgiving holidays kick in, uh, which means that no, nothing gets done until January. So um, as you can see, we've got a few things lined up. Uh, with uh, some general community updates and some discussion I wanted to have with you, um, some things that are going on with the conference, and uh, and I want to have a kind of discussion around how we can create kind of a better uh, testing uh, framework and ability for us to run like a CI CD uh, testing pipeline. So we can talk about some of this uh, or we can uh, table some of it for um, an offline discussion. And then I think Namisha wanted to go through a bit about uh, from the architecture group and kind of give you an update what's going on there. Um, as usual, if you, uh, if you have something that you want to share, um, you're welcome to at the end. Uh, if you want to run a demo or show something you've been working on, I think it'd be great. Uh, I think we may have, I think we have a, We've been experimenting with Grimoire to do um, some metrics, uh, uh, data analysis on the, for the community. I think we're going to share a bit of a work in progress there, although I forgot to add it to the agenda. But um, that's one thing we'll show. But if you have something you want to show, um, please, uh, you know, feel free to do so. Uh, feel free to speak up any time, and uh, we'll go from there. Cool. So uh, just a couple things, housekeeping items, uh, to get them out of the way. Um, not get them out of the way, but to address first. Uh, so we, we've we been talking here at kind of edX headquarters about how to do meetups and events and how to handle speakers and you know, what conferences should we be going to. I noticed there's a page on the wiki that shows like meetup groups um, in diverse uh, locales around the world. Looks like it hasn't really been maintained in a while and I'd like to kick off a discussion soon about how we can uh, reboot that effort. I, I, I've been a long time meetup attendee and organizer. I love the idea of having uh, meetups around the world and having, giving people the, the ability to, um, to participate more fully in, in the kind of the, their local groups. So I'd love to hear feedback from others about how we can do that and maybe we can arrange for uh, a separate discussion first online and then maybe um, uh, resulting in like a schedule or a list of meetups that we'd like to do attend or participate in um, so if there are any uh, uh, if there are any uh, thoughts around that or anyone here who's tried to run open next meetups we're probably going to try to get um, kind of the, the Boston area open edX meetup going uh, soon um, but you know this could be extended to other related meetups like if you're if you have a, an ed tech uh, meetup group in your area it'd be an opportunity to speak and one thing that I'd like to do to support you is to make sure that we can um, send you like a, uh, a care uh, uh, some sort of swag or getting started you know meet up in a box sort of thing where you can hand out t-shirts and other stuff that will make sure that you have access to so that you can uh, get something going where you are uh, so so look for uh, I'm probably just going to start doing stuff on the wiki and sending around links on the mailing lists, uh, on the general mailing list and the general Slack channel. Um, uh, but if you have comments or there's something you, you want to share in that regard on this issue, um, go ahead and do it now. Any thoughts? Well, um, I guess since I organized this, John Baldwin, I, since I organized uh, Django Boston, one of the things that I was thinking about doing was giving a talk on figures as an example of doing a Django reusable app that uses a JavaScript single page application in React front end. Um, and if, so, of course, that's related uh, to, to Open edX. Um, so I'll just toss that out there. Yeah, uh, and, and that sounds like a, a topic that would be worth discussing uh, when, we, uh, when we get our stuff together. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be great to, to have that as a topic. Um, but I think uh, there's a quite a diverse, diversity of uh, geography here you know, on this call in particular, and I know those that have joined 
um, over the last few months have come from uh, all over the world. So it would be great if we can, you know, have a longer, far-reaching discussion around, uh, you know, where we can realistically start some of these up. You know, if we, if we target like three, four, maybe five areas around the world where, where there's a, a density of OpenEdX users, uh, then maybe we can, uh, then maybe we can get something going. Um, so that's that. I'll I'll I'll, I'll set up uh, a longer discussion around that. Look for that. It'd be great to get uh, input from uh, from the community. Um, part of that also means looking at events that we should be going to. If you if you know of any um, ed tech events or other uh, open source or technology or education conferences that you think we can be involved in, uh, let me know so that we can get. We start posting like a call for papers schedule and, and start getting, you know, open edX related topics on the agenda uh, for these different conferences. That would be uh, that would great be great to see. Um, and then finally, you know, I've been talking about getting discourse set up as an eventual replacement for mailing lists. Uh, I think I'm finally ready to actually get a test server going so that we can um, uh, kick it around a bit and see if it would serve our needs for the community. Uh, I'll let you know when I get that going. Uh, should be probably after Thanksgiving, we can really devote uh, any time to it, but I'd really like to get that set up uh, in December. Um, and then related to these things, you know, there's an open question here of, you know, could we, uh, with a reasonable number of resources, uh, collaborate on a community newsletter um, and uh, actually have a, uh, a regular uh, communication a regular outlet for communication where we have people that can come and, and uh, it's a great way to um, make sure uh, that people stay abreast of what's happening in the community. Um, Omar, you have a note about density? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is actually, um, I'm not making this up. So I think the currently there are about like 250 developers in the US. Yeah. Maybe less, maybe more. That's almost one in a million. In my country, there is yeah. 20 open edX developers, and yeah. it has 10 million. So it's like it's a, it's not a really high density. So yeah, but but at the same time, if you look at ed tech groups and uh, events that happen, these happen around the world all the time. And I would like to get more involved with these groups. Uh, not to mention, you know, there's a large research community out there that does research on online. Uh, online learning and online education. There are, there are a large number of you know, faculty who, who, you know, and course design experts you know, who use Open edX or use other um, learning platforms and yeah, sure. the, of relevance to share. You know, so I want, to I want to think inclusively and kind of holistically about online learning in general, but also as it applies to you know, Open edX. Um, yeah. And, then, and yeah, somebody says, I'm from Ethiopia. I think there are five of us. Yes, wow, that's, that's probably that's true. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, you know, obviously it's not going to be tenable in uh, or viable in, in every area of the world. But let's think of a few where it would actually work. Um, I'd really like to to get something going there, uh, you know, and where we can identify these hotspots and uh, do something for them. Um, yes. Yeah, so what yeah. I would say is that we focus less on just open edX a group. We focus less on just engineering. If we like you said, if we um, spot on uh, like ed tech um, conferences, yeah. that would make it possible to make it local. Sure, and that, that's and just so you know, like that's a really big uh, point that I want to address this next year of you know being more inclusive with our community, both in terms of diversity of geography and ethnicity and all that, but also with you know kind of diversity of. The participant, right? Who who is the open edX community? I want it to, to be inclusive of, you know, the groups I just mentioned, the you know, the faculty, the researchers, the learners, um, and as well as you know, the technologists that we all know and love, because I think that these groups working together can create you know a better community and a and a better platform. So that's kind of the uh, the basis for you know stuff that I'm doing uh, uh, now and and for the next year. Um, so let's um, so let's let's set set aside some uh, time or a place to discuss this because I think there's enough uh, interest that we could probably get uh, some good momentum there. Um, and then finally, something that came up this week on the on the Slack channel is kind of around 
um, general Slack usage and policies. And I think it uh, makes sense, you know, as we, we've kind of identified that, you know, the general channel is for, uh, I guess, general questions, but when people are asking questions specific to operating an open edit instance, we kind of send them to the ops channel. Um, we dissuade people or discourage people from posting long, you know, multiple lines of, of text that take up the whole screen. We try to uh, encourage people to do, um, uh, you know, paste bins and that sort of thing. Uh, so to, in that, uh, to, so to that end, um, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if there's anyone here who has any uh, specific input or feedback around how we run the Slack channel and what would be you know, possible improvements. I'm um, definitely uh, open to uh, the idea of, of doing it differently if, if, if it's called for, um, but I kind of want to give people time to actually voice their uh, opinion and feedback here if you, if you thought that, if you had any ideas. One thing I have thought about is getting a bot, like a greeting bot, something to help manage the channel, like telling people like where to go for specific things and letting them know which channels are available uh, for certain, for the most you know, popular questions, I guess. Um, that's one consideration I would need to understand more about Slack bots. When I was managing IRC channels, we had like soupy bots that we could program to do stuff like that. Uh, but that's kind of what we're thinking there. So anyway, if you have thoughts, questions, or feedback there, uh, let us know now. Otherwise, I'll move on to the, the next topic. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm going to assume that everyone here is on Slack <laughs> and that you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so when we go to... So we are uh, well on our way to getting the uh, OpenX conference uh, running. And we have the, the site uh, set up. We have registration, early bird registration. We have the call for papers is open. I encourage all of you to uh, talk to your friends and find out who's available and who would be interested in speaking. If you know of good topics or good speakers or people that should be uh, speaking on a topic, uh, I encourage you to to reach out to them. Uh, I encourage all of you to to submit proposal on your own. Uh, I think this would be a great uh, session. Uh, uh, it'd be great to get as to spread this as as far and wide and possible as possible, especially uh, in light of my previous comments about expanding the OpenEx community to be you know more inclusive. Um, so Nate has a question about uh, AMA sessions with edX team members. I think that's a great idea. Um, I think that's actually pretty good. Uh, we can do AMA with like uh, different members of the OpenX community, maybe a specific engineers or, you know, say the leader of the architecture group, uh, Namisha, uh, or, um, you know, um, you know, Ned, I think is, is always up for stuff like this. Uh, I am up for the stuff like this. We have people that we know in the community that I think would be interesting to talk to. So I think that's a good suggestion, Nate. We were actually going to do a Twitter AMA with the, the keynoters that have been scheduled for the Open edX conference, but that would be kind of additional to this uh, and kind of a separate, uh, would have separate goals anyway. Um, and I think your point about Slack chats being more scalable and inclusive is correct. So we should probably uh, consider ways to, to do that so we can reach more community members. Um, we do record these sessions, so they're available for anyone to view whenever they want at their convenience. Uh, but I think you're right, having a, a text-based format, format would, uh, would actually be pretty good. So, all right, let me think about that. Um, otherwise, uh, any other questions or comments about the conference, how we've set it up so far, the keynote speakers we have. We have a really great lineup of keynote speakers. There's, um, and kind of representing where we're going uh, with the community in general. Um, there's a uh, Candace Teal. She is a very well-known researcher in online learning. Uh, she's currently at Stanford as well as um, uh, Amazon, uh, where she's building out an online learning platform there. Um, we also have a Walter Bender, uh, who is the uh, uh, who was the co-founder. Uh, he was the former director of the MIT Media Lab. He was the co-founder of One Laptop Per Child. He's currently the chief uh, learning architect at Sorcero, which is a, a local startup here. Uh, he'll be a great speaker. Uh, we have Dean Baker. He's a noted economist who talks about intellectual property issues, which gets into something I want to tackle on the, in this next year, open standards and online learning and kind of the intellectual property that uh, impedes or enhances uh, development of you know, open source communities around online learning. So I think that'll be a, a great talk as well. 
Uh, and then we have Jamie Smith from the Linux Foundation who's going to talk about kind of enterprises and open source and how it ties into uh, you know uh, continued learning uh, and continuing education. So those are great, uh, great speakers. I'm really uh, excited to get them. Uh, and just so everyone knows, the call for papers, again, is open. Please submit your proposals today. <laughs> so that, uh, that'll be good. Uh, the conference is only as good as we make it. That's the, uh, so that'll be my last uh, point there. And then finally, before we get to the um, architectural discussion, I wanted to talk about uh, something that's near and dear to my heart, setting up some kind of automated testing or uh, testing pipeline, some kind of uh, continuous integration pipeline for OpenEdX that would be community maintained and community owned. And I kind of wanted to kick off that discussion because it's something that I think could be very powerful uh, if we have enough resources to commit to it. And that's going to be up to kind of all the participants here. Like how, how would we do it? What would it look like? Um, and we can, you know, maybe this isn't the right form to really kick off this discussion, but we can certainly kick off something in the, uh, 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 in the Slack channels uh, and on the wiki. But that's something that I'm going to start, I'm going to start looking into more and more because I think it's extremely important to um, getting this, uh, getting the community really uh, amped up and, amp and going in the, in the right direction. Um, any thoughts on that? Doo -doo -doo. All right, cool. And then uh, before we get to the arch, I think we have, I think Matt is on. Uh, Matt, are you available? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. So, okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to you and you can share uh, some uh, uh, dashboards you're working on. Understand this is very early work, is a work in progress, but we wanted to show you what we're planning as far as like a community dashboard so we can see uh, metrics that we're gathering and how we're going to um, display and render them on the on the new website when we get that going. Uh, hang on one second. Let me... While Matt's getting that set up, let me just say on with the audio, this, the call for proposals for the conference closes in two weeks. And I know what you're thinking, which is, didn't it just open? And the answer is yes. We're in a slightly compressed time schedule because the conference is at the end of March this year rather than the end of May. But we still want to get proposals from everyone, so write them up and put them in. That's it. What he said. <clears throat> okay, can everyone uh, see my screen? Excellent, thank you. I can see it. Stats. Yeah, so uh, we do have a work in progress uh, trying to build dashboards out about different uh, information about Open edX and um, different stats around GitHub and Jira and Slack. Uh, right now, this is just some of the GitHub information that we have. Uh, it includes the number of commits in edX platform and configuration, uh, the people that are doing these commits and the authors, and uh, hopefully we'll have this available for everyone soon. Um, we kind of have a bit of ways to go, and I have to create a few more other dashboards, but uh, hopefully this will be available in, by the end of the year, certainly. So um, definitely reach out to me. My name's Matt. You might see me, or Matt DeBose. You might see me on some PRs every now and then. Um, if you have any questions or would like to have access to this. Um, so yeah, thanks. Uh, there's a question. What is the goal for this? Uh, yeah, so we just want to be, uh, I guess, more transparent and uh, just provide more metrics for everyone in general. I know Omar before was interested in really how we were doing with community pull requests, which would be a lot of the JIRA information that we'll make available. Um, in terms of how long it takes when a uh, PR is open and then it's finally either merged or rejected. Um, and so this tool, uh, it's uh, Grimoire, which uses Elasticsearch and Kibana. Um, and, this, and I'm using a Docker container to get everything up and running. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. I just have to feed it information and then create the various dashboards. Yeah, and so you can see a lot of other stuff about Grimoire. Um, there's a Linux Foundation uh, community or collaborative project called um, Chaos, so something, something, something open source software, <laughs> which is, uh, I know, that was very uh, unhelpful of me. But um, 
but yeah, Grimoire is, uh, has been around for a while and then they um, completely rebooted it to include like the, the elk stack. So uh, yes, thanks Nate. That is the, that is the, that is the, uh, the URL in the chat, in the chat uh, console. Um, but now they've, they've uh, completely revamped it to be based on the elk stack. So Elasticsearch, Kibana and, and, uh, and Logstash. Um, and it, it has a lot of little uh, plugins for pulling in uh, multiple data sources. So it's, uh, it's a pretty nice uh, platform to build on. Cool. All right, anything else you want to share about that, Matt? Uh, that's it for now. I should have uh, better stuff in a couple of Cool. So if you, wanna, uh, if you want more information or if you want to potentially contribute your time or resources to this effort, uh, feel free to contact Matt. Um, all right, so I think we're kind of getting to the point where we're ready for our architectural update. And just a reminder, there's the architectural hangout that will be on November 20th. And it looks like a nice discussion on block store, which is a very, very important topic. Uh, so I'm gonna turn this over to Namisha. I hope she's there, right? Yeah. Cool. Can you guys uh, see my, my screen? Uh, well, right now we see you're attempting to share something. Oh, wait, no, it's me. Oh, yes, thank you. Okay, good, good, cool. Um, hold on. For some reason, I want to just make sure I can see the chat while this, this is happening. Uh, okay, there. Um, okay, thanks. Um, okay, yeah, I got it. Um, so yeah, hi everybody. Uh, so what I was thinking uh, to just bring everyone up to date on is some of the work that we're doing around uh, just process changes um, and establishing a uh, just more structured process around uh, some things that are definitely gonna help us move forward with our platform. So uh, there was two, there were three related, there were three specific processes, one around deprecation and removal, uh, another one around just capturing architectural decision records uh, locally in your own repo. Uh, and uh, the third one was just around uh, OEPs uh, and just the, just updating you guys on uh, uh, two, actually two different OEP PRs that are uh, under review. So. Uh, does does that sound good? Is that going to be useful for this um, resolution times? I mean, that's just Omar, I think, talking to yeah. to you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm late. Sorry. <laughs> oh no, no, that's fine. So um, we're gonna graph your response time. <laughs> um, good one. So, uh, okay, so the deprecation and removal process. So this, this is an OAP that's already been accepted uh, uh, and we are now actively executing on the process. Uh, so there, right, just to bring everyone up to speed, right, we, we want to allow us, the community developers, um, to be able to remove Features that should that no longer need to be that aren't that are no longer used. They're either dormant, um, but still just hanging around in our platform, uh, or it's dead code that was never actually used, or it's um, you know just we have now a replacement with a new feature, and so we should remove uh, the old implementations and so forth. So that's the motivation around this. This is very important for sustainability of our platform. Uh, we don't want our platform to just continue to grow and grow and grow uh, with things, with dead code that's just gonna carry you know, dead weight as we try to move forward and move quicker. So that's the motivation around it. Um, in a nutshell, this diagram shows the, the process that we're proposing. Uh, we, we have a JIRA board where people can add, and I'll, which I'll show you in a minute, where we can add uh, Depper tickets, Depper for deprecation. Uh, and so that's where you would propose it. Uh, and in that, during the proposal, you would indicate dates for when you plan to uh, have a review process. So you're accepting feedback from people on, um, on that proposal. Uh, and then eventually also propose a date uh, when you 
actually eventually are planning to remove that. So uh, this just gives people enough time to plan ahead if they need to, uh, and also uh, you know they they are aware of which Open edX named release the the code would no longer be there. Uh, so. Uh, so yeah, so you propose it, you communicate it to the community, uh, and then you know this it goes through uh, explanations of where, first of all, what we need to include in the ticket, right? Uh, in addition to target dates, a description of what is being removed, if there is a migration path that is needed, description about that as well, uh, and then it talks about where to communicate it. So the edX code mailing list and on Slack and so forth. Um, and once it is accepted, then, you know, uh, in some cases you will want to mark it as deprecated. So it goes into some suggestions of how to go about deprecating it, depending on whether you're deprecating a REST API or certain codes or actually entire repo and so on. So feel free to look through this um, and uh, let us know if you have any questions on that. Um, and then finally, once it is removed, um, you know, just announcing that again uh, and uh, celebrating with a pinata because that's what we do here at edX. Uh, we we if we are when we do re remove some things that just have been around for a long time, we do actually have a pinata party. So uh, hoping that worldwide, no matter whether you are in Ethiopia or in uh, uh, elsewhere, you do get a, a chance to to celebrate as well. Um, if, if you you know if you're helping us with this process, and um, this is what the Jira board looks like. Uh, you we have these the, the states that are in that in that OEP are exactly the states that you see here in the Jira board. So thank you to Marco, our product manager here at X, to for helping us finalize this Jira board. And as you can see, we have two already that are accepted, um, and two that are are still being communicated. We're waiting for. Uh, feedback in case anybody has any concerns or questions about things that are, um, yeah, it, it is public. It should be uh, available for people. I'll actually, I'm, I'll put the link in here and if you're not able to get to it, then that's definitely an indication for us um, that we need to fix that problem. So I'll stop there. Are there any questions about, about this? Um. How can we, I mean, can we add actually Jira tickets? I, from what I understand, the community has mostly comment rights. Oh, no, it, sh it should be public. Um, you should be able to go ahead and add a ticket. Okay. Yeah. Um, actually, there was a, Harvard had a proposal. They wanted to remove a, an image modal, an old way of doing image modals inside uh uh, inside HTML blocks, so um, hopefully they'll they'll also I I directed them to this process, and uh, hopefully they'll be able to also add to this as well. Thank you. What do the dots signify on the Depper? Like there's three out of four, one out of four. Tickets. It's probably how long they've been in a given status. Ah, okay. Visible thing on a board. Yeah, I think this is a Kanban board, so yeah. Okay, cool. Hello, this is Sergio Raccoon, Raccoon Gang. Uh, with regards to this deprecation scenes, um, I have like an example of what could go wrong. Uh, with Hawthorne, uh, the self-generated certificates were abandoned. And it was really a surprise for like most of our customers. So the communication part uh, needs to be mm, to address not only maybe developers, but uh, like instructional designers or something. I mean, this is something to think about. Yeah, so what is a good channel? Um, that's a great question because I have been trying to figure out what are these good channels so far. We've, we've talked about just Slack channels, and we have a pound, the, the general Slack channel, and then there's an OpenX proposal, and then there's edX code. So if there is another location, uh, please, like, what, where, where would instructional designers go for edX? Open well, uh, edX. With the instructional designers directly, uh, 
own, especially because a lot of service providers, Sergey, probably you do too, have mm -hmm. private customers that you have a pretty high touch with. So communicating to you so that you can communicate to them is probably the best approach, I would guess. Uh, yeah, for sure, we, we will talk. Uh, uh, the thing is that, um, I mean, Maybe this was just I don't know a mistake or something uh, and for most uh, for most issues it will be like resolved quickly like I mean removing something which which is not used by anyone is is okay uh, removing something which is used by someone uh, should be maybe addressed on the like this discussion part of of the process. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Just for a quick clarification, what kind of certificate? I missed the prefix you had there. Was it um, PDF or self-generated or what? Self self-generated. Okay. So we can maybe take this offline. You can sort of reach out to me. This is Marco uh -huh. in Slack. I'm not yeah, even okay. sure what I will provide more details. I mean uh, uh, yes, the code was it? removed instead of putting um, after some switch or something. Honor. Yeah, I think. Oh, the honor. Are, are you talking about the honor certificate? Yeah. Yeah. Honor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's talk about that offline. I think. Um, yeah. Sure. I just okay. want to confirm some of the details, but I think what Ned said at a high level is is there. I think the goal is the deprecation process should be one of the ways that the visibility for this kind of stuff is exists. Uh -huh. um, so hopefully, this kind of thing, you know, will be less an issue because all the deprecation or major deprecation of the term will be available there of all the days. Um, but if, if I'm not mistaken, the issue you're talking about is actually was an unintended bug uh -huh. in the state that we're looking to undo. If I'm, if I'm, okay. Okay. It, it, it was a weird sort of unintentional dependency that we introduced. Sure. Um, anyways, I, we can follow up later. Okay. Okay, um, yeah, so they're asking, uh, we can share on Slack the outcome of the discussions around this honor mode issue. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, um, and, and then uh, in terms of communicating it, and if you, if you want to keep an eye out, right, on these communications, right, so the OEP does provide a template uh, with a, you know, with what the subject line of the email would look like. So this way you could filter it out in your own email clients uh, and, uh, and hopefully that um, would be a good way of knowing about these things that are coming in. Any other questions around deprecation removal? Okay. Um, so then the, the next thing I wanted to just touch upon was uh, capturing decision records. And uh, this is something I uh, just want to share with the community because we've been talking a lot about that internally here at edX. And um, just so you know where our head is at. Uh, so uh, architecture decision records, right? Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of ThoughtWorks, but ThoughtWorks is a a leading organization in the industry where they uh, provide a lot of recommendations and best practices around technology and architecture overall. Um, and they have uh, members globally around the world from, um, from, all, from all different nations and so forth. They collectively come together and, and provide recommendations. So um, uh, it's actually a very uh, interesting, uh, uh, actually very, very useful uh, website here if you guys aren't haven't heard of it they recently just released their latest version um, but they have recommendations for techniques platforms tools language and frameworks and things like that um, in particular one of the ones that they've talked about in techniques um, and what they do is they classify things by whether or not they really recommend that everyone should adopt it um, or things that they think you know what we should just stop doing it so for instance like recreating um, you know, enterprise service bus anti-patterns with Kafka, right? They, because they are consulting a consulting agency, 
they know that that's definitely a, a big issue that they find in a lot of the places they consult with and they're recommending that everyone just stop doing that. Um, and, uh, and then they have these other categories of yeah, yeah things we might want to trial uh, and then things that um, we're still assessing, we're not exactly sure, we're trying to figure things out. So like GraphQL for instance is uh, aggregation and having a monolith middleware with GraphQL is definitely on the assess side only right now, not necessarily adopted. So the thing that is currently um, mentioned as, hey, yeah, you guys should adopt it, and we think that everyone should, is this thing called lightweight architecture decision records. And um, I'll, I'll put this link in, um, in chat if anyone else wants to go there directly. Uh, and uh, so what this is is really capturing your decisions as you are making them. We are looking at how we want to evolve our architecture and of course things are always changing and so having a design document that you write once but then it's, it becomes hard to maintain is not is not sustainable so, but having a track having a historical track of decisions that are made along the way allows anybody that is now new to that platform or new to a particular app they can see oh okay this was a historical kind of sure. Sorry, was that somebody trying to talk or? Okay. Uh, so anyway, so the, the decision record, you know, just basically provides a historical trail of why a particular, um, the rationale behind why things are, and if the reasons ever change, right, those are all things that are captured in the historical trail. Um, and so we do have an OAP that is under works um, for developer documentation, which does cover our future direction of what we think really does need to be documented. And so decision records, you know, is definitely one of the primary things that we want to do. Um, with clean code and with, you know, self-documenting self, uh, code and things like that, there's less of a need for adding a lot of um, design documents per se, and those also become hard to maintain. However, decision records, capturing diagrams of providing some holistic uh, perspective on things, uh, how to step-by-step -step things, and then of course our API documentation. Those are like the four main ones that we think um, we definitely need to provide guidelines of uh, how to go about doing all these things. And then in particular, decision records are something that we've started doing already, of course, with OEPs themselves, right, being system-wide decisions, but then capturing these architectural decision records locally within the code here is an example, right, where the first decision record is actually, hey, <laughs> just saying, guess we're going to capture decisions. Um, and so um, they, they don't need to be very heavyweight. They could just be very lightweight, just provide the context, the decision, and the consequences, maybe with some links to your references. Um, and so here in our credentials uh, uh, repo, we, we have four so far. Um, which captures some of the decisions that the team has made. Uh, and this is hopefully going to help people, uh, you know, come up to speed on, on, on the inner, inner thinking, you know, the motivation and rationale for the developers. Here's another one in edX platform itself. Uh, and, uh, oops, what happened? Uh, and that was around, we're creating a great book. And, you know, like I said, it doesn't have to be that long, but it, even the few few minutes that you just capture, whether it was a hallway conversation or whatever resulted in that decision, just taking some time to capture it would be great. Here's a one that's a little bit lengthier, but you know it makes it clear to the team, uh, whether it's three weeks from now, because they forgot what we decided, or to a, a team three years from now that's trying to understand what's going on behind the code. So, so that's decision records. Any, any questions on that? Um, would every repository have, have such thing or just the main ones? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one of the other things about these local decisions records is the, the more that you can co-locate it with the code is, is better uh, for two reasons. One is that in terms of maintaining it and sustaining it, right, uh, if the developer is already there, it's more likely that they're going to um, go ahead and update it. Uh, and it, whether it's, it could even be in the same PR, right, that goes ahead and makes that, makes a change that the decision is talking about. Uh, so 
So that's one reason um, in terms of keeping it updated. And the other reason is discovery, right? So like if I'm working in the grades app and I, I want to, um, you know, understand what, what was behind the, the behind um, the rationale behind things, right? I, it's, it's easier to discover and I'm already in that context. So the more that it's co-located, the better. In the future, I do expect that we will want to have some tooling that can allow discovery, a uh, more centralized tool, right? Where you can find all the decisions across the system. Um, but for now, just even getting us started to getting into that mode of capturing these decisions is, is, is very important. And um, getting teams to be able to do that internally. And I highly recommend you guys also take a stab at it in your own development uh, and see if you're finding it to be valuable as well. Any other questions on that? Cool. Okay, cool. So then the, the final thing, just uh, um, this PR is open right now. We're introducing, for those of you, right, who are familiar with our, um, uh, you know, who are familiar with our open edX proposals process, um, OEP1 describes that process. And the main thing that this PR does is introduce a, a, a new status. Um, so uh, there's this now new thing called provisional. And uh, provisional just basically means that uh, there, there was a proposal, it was under review. However, uh, we're not yet ready to accept it because we want to have some more backing, right? We wanna, uh, we wanna make sure that it is actually gonna get adapted in our system or it, um, it needs, a, it needs a, a viable example that people then can follow and things like that. So um, this is a new state that I've added and, and as part of this PR, I've updated a a few OEPs that we have that um, uh, that that I, I believe really should be provisional because they're not yet being used. But in in design form, it looked good. Uh, but we still need to go about and uh, and make use of it. So this just basically makes that more clear. It's very similar to so provisional in many ways is very similar to tech radars like assess mode right where we're still it was good we're, we're trying to assess it uh and once we've really said yes we're going to do it then we can move it to the trial or adopt state so um over time i think you might see because <laughs> as you can see i'm starting to really like tech radar as a great way of communicating these things that um you might see us adopt that even for open edX in the future That's great. Um, Thanks, Namisha. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Is there anything else you want to go over, or or is that basically everything? Um, no, that's no. That, that that was it. I was just reading up what Sergey and Omar are saying. Yes, it would be great to <laughs> <laughs> uh, figure out retroactively um, what people were thinking. Um, yeah, putting it on Google would be great. What, what does that mean? The the decisions you mean, or um, yeah, sorry. Um, so yes, I mean having such decisions is really great. Um, the thing is that it would be awesome if we have a tool that aggregates those decisions, like from all the edX repos, and put them in a reader doc or like just any plain HTML thing. So if one if someone Google's them, then it can be found. Right. That's what I meant. Yeah. Yes. 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 No, for sure. That that makes sense. Good. Discovery of documentation is just such a um, <clears throat> difficult thing. Uh, we're finding that to be a very big challenge here at edX. I mean, we use, as you guys know, we use Confluence, and even just being able to try to find old documents and keeping them maintained is is a is a very hard problem. And that's one of the big reasons why I'm pushing for the decision records is that it is co-located and it's an, a little bit easier to maintain. Um, because it's it's very much immutable, right? You don't have to go back and worry about updating things. It's more about just keep track of that chain and history. Um, and then, uh, but yeah, right now, I mean, discovery is definitely a very important component of developer documentation. So. Cool, any other questions? Um, 
Just, um, this is John, uh, just, uh, <clears throat> I, I, for one, really appreciate uh, the efforts that you guys are going through uh, to improve uh, uh, visibility and help make things easier for us to uh, discover and learn. Thanks, thanks, John. I'll take. <laughs> um, it's it's a it's a it's an it's a it takes a village and it's definitely a group effort. So um, and uh, yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, it's a marathon, not a sprint. But many, many thanks to Namisha for uh, pushing this along. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Um, cool. And just a reminder, uh, you can find out more about architecture and changes going on there um, at the monthly architecture hangout. So if you're developing with OpenEdX and you want to hear more about architectural decisions, um, definitely check that out. Um, so cool. Um, I think that's the end of the agenda. Is there anything that people want to talk about uh, outside of what was on the agenda? This is a open space for you to, to bring any issues or if you have something you want to share, uh, this would be a good time to do it. Omar wants to give a big shout out. Did you, did you see that to the latest episode? Ah, that's, yeah, so I think, so that goes to uh, Matt DuBose and uh, Natalia, who's been uh, helping us uh, part time. So uh, those two have done a really great job of getting uh, contributions triaged, as well as Marco, who's been uh, a huge help as well. So, and there are probably others I'm missing, um, but those three especially get uh, a shout out. Hey, John, Mark, uh, this is Nate. Hey. Uh, so I know there was talk in the past about having the talk proposal process more community oriented. Yep. As opposed to just having edX folks reviewing proposals. How, how is that playing out in next year's conference? I have reached out and I have, I have secured uh, commitments from external people to help um, with this year's uh, conference. So, so a program committee. So I've got uh, somebody from Stanford. I've got somebody from class central and I've got somebody from opensource.com. And the reason I haven't extended that invite to most people here is because a lot of people here are going to be submitting talks and it's difficult to work out conflicts of interest. However, if you know of a way to work that out uh, cleanly, uh, feel free to send me a note and then we can have that conversation uh, offline. But, but yes, I have included external people in this year's program committee. In fact, this is the first time we're going to have an actual program committee, uh, but it's going to be a very kind of low touch one um, and informal but it is the beginning of one. So if you want to talk about that in more depth, I'm more than happy to, to you know, set up a call with you or others if you're interested as well. Okay, well, I'm glad to hear that it's going to be external voices, not just edX folks. Um, I mean, a simple solution to the how to deal with conflict of interest would just be you're, you're excluded from voting on a talk that you submitted. Exactly, and, and that's something that, you know, I've definitely considered, um, and I and I would consider, uh, because okay. I don't think there's one way to do this. I think there are certainly multiple ways to do it well uh, to to achieve the you know goals. So let's uh, let's let's continue that discussion. I'm, I'm more than I'm open to suggestions. Okay, cool. cool. I'll, I'll follow up with you later on it. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Um, and so, just a reminder: go to con.openedx.org. Uh, that's where you're going to find the, everything from registration to the call for papers to, and there's a handy dandy sponsorship prospectus. For the first time we have a proper sponsorship prospectus. Please take a look at that, even if just to admire the work that went into it. Thank you to our graphics department for putting that together. Um, Gabe and uh, Fernanda uh, put that together. So, uh, and if you want to give us money as a result, well, you wouldn't turn that down either. So, uh, okay. Uh, anything else before we break? And then I'll post this on YouTube um, soon. Thoughts, questions, suggestions? Okay. I'm going to say goodbye, and we're going to have the next one in December. Um, feel free to make suggestions about time zones and 
when we should have this. Uh, definitely looking to make sure that we can, you know, reach as many people as possible. So let me know what you think. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody. Bye bye now. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. <clears throat>